Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be going over a very well-known geometrical shape. And most of you know this shape as the donut. However, it actually has a math mathematical name and that's called the torus. Now the torus, as you can see in this diagram and what I said before, is essentially just a donut. And there are many different types of toruses. And these toruses each have their own different properties. And in this video, we're just going to figure out the basic properties about a torus. For example, what's the volume and what's the surface area and things like that. And we're just going to be using very basic logic to, be, to, figure, to figure these out, unlike the proofs that require calculus and such. So the first thing, property that we're going to figure out is how do you find a torus's volume and with that we're going to have to define some properties of a torus and some pr parameters for a torus in order for us to really figure out the dimensions of this torus now the first thing that we're going to do is assume that this torus when looked from above is composed of two perfect circles, because if we had ellipses, it would be a little bit more complicated. And this is what we're going to go with for a standard torus, as any torus would be. Now, we're going to have to define two values, and it's easier for us to look at the top-down version of the torus in order to define some values. So the first one we have is defined as big R, or the major radius of a torus and we call this a capital R. So obviously since we have a major radius we must have a minor radius which is equal to a lowercase r and that is this length right here. But the problem is Right now, I haven't defined what this point here is, and it's really simple to explain. That point simply is just halfway between one side and the other side of the smaller circle. So, if we were to inscribe a circle inside the torus, like this, the minor radius would be the radius of this circle. And similarly, the major radius would be the point from the center of the torus to the center of the circle that we had before. So, as you can see, we have uh, two values so far that define a torus, the major radius and the minor radius. But you may be wondering how these come into play here, because we saw that the minor radius went to the edge of the torus, and the major radius, for some reason, doesn't go all the way to the end of the torus. For some reason, it just stops in the middle of the torus, which is very weird. And we'll figure out why it's more convenient to use this version of a major radius when we get to the volume. Now, there's one thing that we also have to note when we're calculating the volume of this torus, because... Some tor toruses, again, like I said, all toruses are different. Some toruses might be extremely flat, like this torus right here, which may even just be a disc that is only that has very little height. And there's toruses that are very high, like this one. So it all depends on different variables. So let's go ahead and define a torus that we can actually find a volume of. So here's a diagram of a normal torus, and what I'm going to do is draw two circles. These are the cross sections of the torus. So let's say you took a torus and you cut it exactly in half. These two points, these two circles, or ellipses are what you're going to see. Now in a standard torus, these cross sections would both be circles. 
and that's what we're going to deal with in this video. You may have noticed that these circles also have radius little r. And that's ex really easy to prove because, as you can see, if we draw the other circle in, it has the same diameter as it shares a diameter with the cross section. So we have proved that little r is the radius of the minor radius is the radius of this cross section. And similarly, it is the same here. Now we can finally calculate the air, the volume of a torus. So let's go ahead and draw in the big R, or the major R. Let's find the exact center, and we have our big R. And we can, let's switch back so that we have two diagrams, one that is 3D and one that is top-down, which looks like a 2D diagram. So obviously, as we can see here, we might want to go back to some simpler formulas for volume for other shapes that have circles in them. And a perfect example of one is a cylinder. And there's also the cone. Each of them, when you take a cross section by cutting it in half, or by cutting by a plane to the that is parallel to the bottom of the base of that shape, you'll end up with a cross section that is a circle, similarly with the cone. Now, as you can see, this circle compis consists of part of the cylinder. Now, as we move, we move the circle up and down, we'll be going through every single circle. And we can see that this circle, combined with infinitely many other circles, make up a cylinder. So, how many of these circles do we really need? And since these circles have zero height, we would technically, again, need infinitely many of these circles. So how did we get to the finding the volume of a cylinder? Well, similarly with a rectangle, where you take the base and multiply it by the height, you would take the base of this, cyl this cylinder and multiply it by the height. So this doesn't mean that we're using each of these circles. That's a completely other, completely different thing. Think about it as having h times 1. So we have disks, h disks, each of height 1. And as you can see here, each of these disks with height 1 would make up the cylinder. Now with the cone, it turns out that finding the volume of a cone is a little bit more complicated, but it ends up being something like one-third base times height, which is extremely similar to the vol volume of a cylinder. Now, we start to see a correlation with base times height. There always seems to be a certain base, and there always seems to be a value that marks out how many of the base you need, how many of the base with a... Now if we go to the cone, we find that the volume of the cone is one-third base times height. So we're starting to see a correlation here. We see that we're always multiplying the base by a height, where the base is some value that repeats, re repeatedly repeats in the, in the shape. For example, in the cylinder, we had a circle, and we had a ton of these circles repeatedly repeating themselves. If we took infinite, and they make up infinitely many, many spots in this cylinder. Similarly, we have the same with the, the cone. And we see that the height is always perpendicular to the base. With the rectangle, that is true. With the cone, 
That is also true, and same with the cylinder. So, we can try to apply our knowledge to that of the torus. Now, when we saw the cylinder, we saw that the base, or the cross-section, continually followed on a path of the height. Its center was always on the path of the height, the line. And so, it was in any cross-section, this cro the cross-section would always have its center at the height. So, in this case, we're probably going to use this circle as our base. Now, it's not really the base because it's not a base, unlike the other shapes which actually have a base. The torus doesn't really have a an actual shape for a base. So we're going to use this circle as our base in quotation marks. Now, we, we know that this base has to follow a path. And when we follow the base around the path of a torus, we see that its center draws a line. And it makes a circle. What's the radius of this circle? Well, the radius would be big R, or the major R, major radius. Now, we also have the minor radius here, and we can immediately see what our height would be. And that's the circumference of a circle with radius major radius, the length of a major radius. So, our, we've, using this information, we're just going to do base times height. And realize that this is not really base times height. We're just tracing the point of a certain shape as it travels around the torus to draw out the volume. So, when we do this, we can find that the volume would be... So first we're calculating the circumference, which is 2 pi times big R. And now we have to find the area of the base, which isn't really the base. I'm going to keep repeating that. And so we have that the base has area R squared pi. And when we multiply these two together, we end up getting 2 pi squared big R R squared. And that is the volume of a torus. Now, there are many different ways to write this that can be used in different convenient ways. But just remember that this is just the base times the height. So if you forget ever, if you forget this formula, just remember that it's always going to be the circumference of the circle with radius big R and the area of the circle with radius, small r. Now it's time to find the surface area of a torus. So as we saw before, where the small circle of a torus traces out the volume of the torus, we can see that if we have a circle and we move it around, if we take the circles, only the circle circumference, and we move it around the torus along the big circle, then we end up with the surface area of a torus. So, the surface area of a torus is just the circumference of the smaller circle times the circumference of the larger circle, which is equal to 4 pi squared large r small r. So, as we can see, it's actually not that hard to find the volume and the, the surface area of a torus using some basic logic. However, if you want a rigorous proof, then you're going to have to use some more advanced concepts. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have other videos on some topics that aren't really covered that much in school mathematics. Thanks for watching.